This is CBC Here and Now. I don't want all the animals in the ocean to die. And I don't want, well, the ocean to die. Older folks have to show up. We have made a mess of things. The planet is dying and we need to make a stand and save it. If one person can make a change, every individual can make a change about the world too. Across the province, thousands joined the movement, marching, demanding action on the climate crisis. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. Around the world today, young people took part in protests demanding leaders take urgent action against climate change. Young people may have started the movement, but all ages have joined the cause, carrying signs and shouting slogans, calling attention to the ongoing climate emergency. The Fridays for Future marches started just a year ago, led by young climate activist Greta Thunberg. Today, more than 150 countries took part, drawing hundreds of thousands. Well, here in St. John's, there was a massive rally this morning as thousands marched from Memorial University to the steps of Confederation Building. Here and now, Cease Hare was there. Governments all over the world, Canada and Newfoundland included, claim they are taking action, but the politics and solutions are still nowhere to be seen. It started with a warm-up at Munn's Clock Tower, and then the demonstrators took to the streets and took aim at this province's seat of power. Thousands shut down Prince Philip Drive, marching towards Confederation Building, where the pressure was placed at the feet of provincial politicians and those running in the upcoming federal election in October. No more coal! No more oil! Keep your carbon in the soil! No more Now, more than ever, we need political representatives who represent us and our values and not corporations! It was one of the larger rallies at Confederation Building in recent memory. Boisterous and enthusiastic, they made it loud and clear inaction in the fight against climate change in recent years is no longer tolerable. They want the province to declare a climate emergency and implement measures to reduce emissions and lessen this province's reliance on the fossil fuel economy. We are now going to do an activity, so I want to get everyone to take out their cell phones. Collectively, they filled Premier Dwight Ball's email inbox with thousands of letters demanding action. The province of Newfoundland and Labrador is not doing enough to combat climate change. Today, we ask you to take a step forward. Please declare a climate emergency. And also a moment of reflection with the symbolic death of Mother Earth. Organizers say this is far from over and they will be back. Back on Friday, November the 1st, in fact. They'll be here again and they'll be just as loud. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the rain held off for the march earlier today, but look at that. You can barely see the narrow, you can't even see the narrows there. Uh, a foggy evening. If we take a look at uh, what we're seeing as far as visibility down to 0.6 kilometers in St. John's, uh, we are seeing lots of fog along the northeast coast and that will generally continue uh, as we head through the evening hours. We'll likely see that lift though overnight. Lots of showers in play as well. And as we uh, take a look at what we're expecting tomorrow morning, those temperatures still sitting uh, in the double digits for tomorrow. The sun will peak out as well at some point in the afternoon and then more rain moves in for Sunday. We'll likely even see the first flakes fly for parts of western Labrador. I'll have all the details coming up.
Thanks, Ashley. Well, keeping with our top story, today's climate strike. It's a global movement many credit 16-year-old Greta Thunberg with starting. The Swedish climate activist took notice of the protest in St. John's today, sharing this picture of the parkway on Twitter, along with photos and videos of other marches around the world. Here and now's Katie Breen was in the crowd for this morning's march in St. John's. Here's what she heard. Oh my goodness, the young people, they're amazing. They're totally inspiring. They got this idea that they can change the world by saving the planet. Well, that's a pretty good idea. I, I, I'm down with that, I'm all in. And I think, uh, you know, older folks have to show up. We have made a mess of things. <laughs> I just thought it was just kind of an important, it might have been a little bit of a lesson, you know, important history, just kind of miss one day of school and just get to see, you know, what the politics of Canada is about and get to see everything. I've seen all over social media that the Amazon rainforest, it's pretty much dead. Like all the animals are extinct from there and um, that's sort of what made me want to come out and protest today. Why is that important to you? Well, it's where we live. The earth is gonna die. Uh, maybe in like decades if we don't stop. Why did you come out here today, Jack? Because I wanted to do the climate march and I wanted to share my sign with people because I think we need to be more, well, not polluting the ocean. We need to get rid of plastic straws, plastic bags, every, most things plastic and start turning to like electric cars mainly and just start recycling and reducing everything we use. What do you think that this will achieve today? It will basically get, get the ears of the people at the Confederation Building and definitely, you know, make a stand and hopefully change the climate for the better. Do you feel people are doing enough about it? No. Um, there, I know it was a lot today, but it didn't look like the full St. John's uh, people. I still see people driving right now, so I didn't think enough people came out today. Well, to the West Coast now, where hundreds of people took to the streets. The march there was led by university students, but they weren't the youngest in attendance. Here now's Troy Turner reports. About 500 people marched and chanted through the heart of Cornerbrook this afternoon. Students at Grenville campus organized the protest, but people of all ages showed up, despite the damp weather. Among the biggest partners was Cornerbrook Regional High. I want a future, and I think everybody else wants a future. I have ideas for my future, and I want my education to be worth something instead of pointless. What's the point in spending all the money on an education if it's not going to come to use? And the world's going to be not such a good place. Faith Badstone was surprised by the support. I did not expect anywhere near this amount. I'm just grateful that people realize they have to step up and come out. Speakers talked about the science of climate change and the need for leaders to take action. Keith Cormier of the Halibu Band spoke of the need for generational change and had the crowd touch the earth as a gesture of thanks and future protection. Some marchers said protesting might not bring immediate solutions, but could help their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And uh, it's this generation that has to change it, but it's my generation too that has to support it. And so I walk today for that reason. Well, the rain has fallen a little harder and the crowd has fizzled out here at the climate protest in Cornerbrook, but that hasn't dampened the spirits of organizers. In talking to the young people involved, this climate protest will not be the last. So we'll expect to see more protests such as this in the coming weeks, months, and even years ahead. Troy Turner, CBC News, Cornerbrook. And in Grand Falls, Windsor today. <laughs> 50 or so students marched on Grenfell Heights. Organizers say they were impressed with the turnout, which, like in Cornerbrook, included a few older supporters. Well, my wife's sign says it all, that we're here for our grandchildren, because this issue of climate change is you know, bigger than all of us, and that young 
teenager from Sweden has certainly crystallized people's sense that this is an urgency that the adults have not done well on and somebody has to stand up and thank God for the young people. I think that adults hear us when we speak because we speak from a place of wanting to have a future and I know they sympathize with that and I think that we have the power to change votes and that we have the power to change the world when we speak together. I'm certainly willing to pay the cost. I mean, we use recyclable bags. That was the first step in our family. And we're trying not to use plastic bags, not to use plastic at all. And these paper straws and all these uh, containers that you buy when you get your takeaway food. Well, still in Grand Falls, Windsor, police are issuing a warning. There's an increased police presence on the west side of town as officers look for 27-year-old Ian Williams. Williams is wanted in relation to an armed robbery. The public is asked to report any sightings of the man and to not approach him as he is considered armed and dangerous. On Sunday night, two convenience stores in Grand Falls, Windsor were robbed. Two men were arrested and weapons were seized. Police were looking for a third suspect. Le Carbonier family doctor has had his license to practice medicine suspended after being found guilty of professional misconduct. Earlier this year, the College of Physicians and Surgeons held a tribunal to hear a female patient's complaint. The group found Dr. Aiden Drover gave the patient a breast exam without her consent. The woman was in his Carbonier office in 2016 for Transport Canada Marine Medical. Now, this exam does not require a breast exam. Drover's license to practice medicine has been suspended for a month, and he's also been fined $15,000 to cover the costs of the tribunal. Drover and his lawyer declined to comment. Well, relatives of Ann Lucas say they're living in fear after her killer was granted day parole. Robert Legg killed the Stephenville woman back in, 20, in 2003. Her family says they never thought they'd have to see his face again. But once again, here's CBC's Troy Turner. Uh, we're shocked and sadly we're no longer surprised. 16 years is not enough time to heal the deep wounds felt by the family of Ann Lucas. The Stephenville woman was murdered by her ex-boyfriend in 2003. She was 56 years old at the time. Robert Legg was sentenced to 18 years for second-degree murder. He is now in his early 80s and was initially released on day parole for six months in February. Last month, that parole was extended for another six months. Tracy McIsaac is the niece. I've always thought that people always have to work so hard to get out of jail and <laughs> we're working so hard to keep someone in it. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's disheartening. While the day parole decision upsets the family, it's realizing that he has already visited Stephenville, his hometown, that angers them most. We shouldn't have to live in fear. We didn't do anything wrong. We're not the criminal and we're the ones living in fear. But the system is absolutely messed up. If we're in Canada, land of the free, <laughs> but there's nothing free about it. We're now, we're now the prisoners. The family has support. The Bay St. George Status of Women Council is holding a rally in support of them next Friday. Troy Turner, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Now an update on a CBC Investigates story. A Mount Pearl headstone company that faced criticism from unhappy customers is now in receivership. Earlier this month, a trustee took possession of property owned by WD Kenny Granite Company. According to documents, the company owes at least $600,000 to creditors. Most of that is owed to a bank and the Can uh, Canada Revenue Agency. But the list also includes customers who took the business to small claims court after paying for headstones they say they never received. The trustee told CBC News that a property appraisal is currently in the works. The receiver will then figure out next steps to sell any assets. The former chair of the Labrador Grenfell Health Board is out. After two separate investigations into his conduct and into board governance, the health department has released few details, but what has emerged suggests the board itself needs a major overhaul. Here and now, Jacob Barker has been looking into this for us. So, Jacob, what uh, do we know about the man at the center of this story? Yeah, well, uh, Boyd Knoll was uh, chair of that board until November of last year. That's when he was suspended. And it was after allegations of harassment and bullying were brought forward to the Department of Health 
Uh, there were also issues around board governance that were brought forward. Yesterday, Minister John Hagee was here in Happy Valley Goose Bay uh, to hear the results of the investigations. It's been a difficult time, I think, for all concerned, and I think I'd like to uh, thank people for their forbearance during the process and their willingness to stick with it. The two reports were taken together, uh, and collectively, um, uh, the former chair was informed uh, again by letter uh, of the findings uh, and, and that he would uh, not be returning to the board in, a, um, uh, in any formal role. Now, the department is not releasing either of the reports publicly, but they have released nine recommendations that have to do with board governance. They include things like assessing how competent board members are, providing education to members, and creating a code of conduct. And Hagee says the process for bringing on new board members needs to improve. A Labrador Grenfell is a very diverse a geographic and uh, demographic uh, group with interests uh, that uh, aren't probably not represented, uh, perspectives that brought to the board that need to be enhanced. Now, I did manage to reach former uh, Chair Boyd Knoll by phone about an hour ago. He said he's not ready to respond right now to the findings of those investigations, but he did say that he may have something to say in the coming days. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. PAL airline pilots have filed a complaint saying the company is violating their union rights. The pilots have been represented by the Airline Pilots Association since June and claim ever since management has been making rule changes in retaliation. Pilots say they're losing seniority and vacation time. They're deterred from taking sick days and are expected to buy their own iPads to replace paper manuals. In a statement today, Powell says it's looking forward to commencing negotiations with the union and that it intends to maintain a positive relationship with its pilots. Well, uh, we've got some fog on the go right now. As we head through the night tonight, that fog should lift. Some rain tomorrow too, but I'll have all the details coming up.
Welcome back, everyone. Hi, Ashley. Hello. It's Friday. <laughs> it, Very happy about that. It is Friday. A uh, little bit of a wet start, mm -hmm. or at least a foggy start to the day, but those temperatures, not too bad not out too there. Not too bad. Double digits. I'll <laughs> take that at yes. this point. <laughs> we certainly will. We'll take a look at those uh, temperatures that we reached today. About uh, 12 degrees in St. John's, 14 in Badger, Corner Brook, sitting at 15 degrees this afternoon, and then back to the single digits for Nain, only reaching a high near 7. And as we speak, uh, those temperatures pretty similar to uh, what we saw. We're starting to see them drop. They're not going to drop too much, though, as we head through the night tonight. For most of the island, actually, sitting at 11 degrees for St. John's, only dropping maybe another degree through the night tonight. So here's those showers we saw a little bit earlier. Plenty of cloud cover as well. South Coast starting to see uh, some clearing, and uh, that fog should lift for uh, the island, or at least for the northeast coast as we head through the night tonight as those winds shift. That shower activity will continue along the coast, northern peninsula, and uh, pretty much the northeast coast as well with some drizzle through the overnight. Otherwise, we'll start to see some clearing skies for Lab West. That'll head towards Happy Valley Goose Bay as well. And then the south coast will see those clearing skies through the night and then towards central as well. Now, as far as those temperatures, as I said, not dropping too much, maybe another degree or two. Northwesterlies going to pick up about 90 or 90, 30 to 50 kilometers per hour tonight. 10 degrees for Corner Brook with showers uh, gusting upwards of about 40 kilometers per hour. But again, that south coast will likely see some, some clearing skies and 10 degrees. Now for Lab West, I mentioned those clearing skies yesterday. Also mentioned the potential to uh, see the Aurora. So if you are out and about and you want to see them look up, there's a potential that uh, there'll be a show tonight. Eight degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay. So a lovely evening uh, down to two degrees for Lab City. So if you are heading out, make sure you bundle up. Six degrees for Nain, and again, going to hang on to that chance of showers along the coast. Now, into tomorrow, still have uh, some cloud cover in play along the northeast coast, anticipating that we'll likely see a drizzly start to the day tomorrow, and likely going to hang on to that cloud cover for the northern portion of the Avalon, really anywhere along the coast. Might see a few peaks of sun, but the best chance of clearing will be towards central and the south coast before more cloud cover moves in and the area of uh, or a little disturbance that will move through will bring some showers across the big land and then towards the west coast into the early morning hours. And that will generally continue as we head through the day uh, on Sunday as well. So here's a look at those temperatures, a degree or two warmer than what we're seeing today. 14 degrees for St. John's again, have that drizzle in the morning, maybe a few peaks of sun, but the Southern uh, Avalon will certainly see that sunshine. Same for the Buren Peninsula, 15 degrees for Marystown, Clarenville 15 as well. And then uh, heading towards Gander and Grand Falls, Windsor, uh, mid to high teens tomorrow afternoon with that sun peaking out as well. Again, that chance of showers in the first half of the day, South Coast sunshine. And then late day is when we'll start to see those showers move in for the west coast. Cornerbrook reaching a high near 13 degrees. Winds generally light, 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. Uh, 13 degrees for St. Anthony. Light winds there, 5 to 15 kilometers per hour. 10 degrees for Cartwright. Going to stay in the double digits for now on Saturday for Lab City. Uh, but as we head through Sunday, those temperatures really dipping. And again, I keep mentioning that potential for some snow. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, when you visit the rooms in St. John's, you expect to find art, history and culture. You might not expect to see skateboarders catching some air on an indoor half pipe, but you'll see that in there this weekend. A new exhibition about border culture and history is opening at the rooms tomorrow. Here's a look inside. Right. Border X is an exhibition of contemporary art from artists living in indigenous nations across Canada who all surf, skateboard, or snowboard. And those different practices weave their ways into the artwork that they make and that you see in the gallery in different ways. This weekend we have built a 20 by 25 foot half pipe downstairs and uh, we're offering a series of clinics. So there's a youth only clinic, a girls only clinic, a number of open skates. And uh, Saturday night, we have the main party opening celebration with uh, DJ Slim Macho, uh, local skate crews, and some of the van skaters as well. Uh, all free admission all weekend long, and all the clinics are free as well. First come, first serve.
it's interesting looking at the board culture overall, those three different types of expression and movement within the landscape. And uh, looking back historically, you can trace the, the threads of these different practices back to uh, Hawaii and Polynesian cultures uh, surfing in the Pacific Ocean about 1,500, 2,000 years ago. Um, and you can watch the, the, each of those forms evolve over the years until it hits the coast of California in the 1960s and becomes a longboard or the shorter skateboard that we know today. I think that the exhibition is really thought-provoking. There's some, some work that's really intense and, and is looking back at the terrible history of colonialism and uh, the aspects of, our, of Canada's history uh, that go along with that. But there's also uh, more materially exploratory, more dreamy works. There's, there's works that have a bit of humor in it, like Mark Igliorte's Eskimo Roll video, which is just behind me. And uh, I think that it will really challenge viewers to think outside of the box, but that I, I think there's a lot of takeaways that will stick with people uh, in the coming weeks after each visit, and hopefully people come back multiple times to, to really develop that thought. The skate ramp was an opportunity for us to bring the, the, the promise of the exhibition into the rest of the gallery to give space to these different practices and, and for those communities to be able to come in and see what they do, their forms of self-expression represented in a new way at the gallery and at the rooms. And it's been a really great opportunity for us to reflect back on how we see ourselves and hopefully over the course of the exhibition, which is up until January 5th, uh, the community will maybe get some different insights and uh, different relationships with us as well.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it's been a day of action for young people across the country and the globe. In St. John's, hundreds of people lined the streets to demand leaders take action against climate change. But before the march began, one young demonstrator got to put her questions directly to Premier Dwight Ball. Grade 11 student Alice Ferguson O'Brien is one of the protest leaders in St. John's, and she interviewed the Premier on the St. John's Morning Show. Take a look. You wronged us last year when we stood here on three separate occasions and got no action. Yeah. Do not wrong us again with platitudes. This time, take real action or remember, we will not forgive you. I look at Nova Scotia and I look at New Brunswick to your other question, Alice, around reducing carbon footprints in other jurisdictions. Nova Scotia right now still uses a lot of coal. 1,400 megawatts of their power is coal-fired. New Brunswick is no different. We have hydroelectricity resources that we can use in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick to get them off of dirty coal. Well, I think that pointing fingers at like other governments and saying like you're doing, we're doing a better job than you. I don't think that's a really proactive response to the climate emergency. So how do you think that Newfoundland and Labrador can have a more proactive instead of a we're doing better than you? How can we have a say uh, like a new movement where we're going to say we're going to do better than ourselves? We're going to do the best that we can. And we've been able to do that just by signing on to the Pan Canadian Framework, one of the first jurisdictions to do so. Uh, but we all recognize that, you know, globally and nationally, we all have a role to play. And some of the role that we can play is helping other jurisdictions get themselves off of things like coal. And that's something we're into discussions right now with Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, to get them off of coal, because eventually that lands in, in our jurisdiction. Who here feels empowered right now? Alice, is there anything else that, on your list that you wanted to ask the Premier? Yeah, I definitely want to ask you about what would you say to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who are currently being affected by the lack of action that like the province, the country and the world has taken on climate change. So like people like the crab and the salmon fishermen and fisher people around the province and people living in northern Labrador who are being affected by the lack of action that's been taken over the last like 30 years. So what would you say to them? It's never too late. And that is the reason why we put in, in place our own carbon a or climate change action plan. It came into effect in January uh, 2019. There's over 40 recommendations of things that we can actually do as individuals to reduce our carbon footprint. Newfoundland has seen climate-related like climate and like exploitation-related disasters before in the economy and like the environment. Because we've seen this happen before, I think Newfoundlanders and Labradorians should be really able to acknowledge and understand how big of a threat this causes. So that's just something I'd like to put out there. Well, I appreciate those comments, and as I said, you'll be welcome today at Confederation Building. I think all of us can do a, our part in reducing our carbon footprint in our province. Thank Definitely. you very much. Well, as we heard earlier in the show, Greta Thunberg was in Montreal today to take part in a massive climate change rally. She also met with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau before the march. He's here to just blame someone and of course he has a lot of responsibility which he has not and he's of course obviously not doing enough but we need to because this is such a huge problem this is a system that is wrong so the Swedish climate activist was critical of Trudeau's actions on climate change, saying all politicians need to listen to and act on science. Thunberg also met with indigenous youth and environmentalist David Suzuki before the rally. Hundreds of thousands of people joined Thunberg on the streets of Montreal, demanding politicians implement plans to reduce carbon dioxide emissions to zero by 2050. Marches were held across Canada with huge crowds also turning up in Toronto and Vancouver. Well, yesterday we told you about a company that aims to build a waste to energy plant in Lewisport, turning European plastics into electricity. But did you know just 9% of the plastic we use in Canada actually gets recycled? So just what happens to the rest? There have been studies, plenty of speculation, and tonight a sneak peek inside a CBC Marketplace investigation pulls the curtain back. Using hidden cameras, we can show you what they found Here's David Common. Natasha Sumera is a super recycler, even hauling extra waste to the depot on top of her blue box, expecting it'll all get a new life. 
we know that we have like finite resources or that's what we're told. Um, and so I think that we have a responsibility to do our part. And yet CBC Marketplace located thousands of tons of Western plastic in enormous dumps amid shady recyclers here in Malaysia. Standards are lax, labor cheap. Processors will take just about anything, but that doesn't mean it's all getting recycled. Sometimes it's just burned. Holy moly. Look at how big this is. We snuck into this recycling factory asking the question, is this what Canadians expect when they take their blue box to the curb? This is Canadian Tire. This is Marketplace IGA. This is Real Canadian Superstore, Compliments, Water, the Dollar Store. Reprocessing it or burning it, leaving potentially toxic smoke in the air here. Waste management expert Myra Hurd says with less than a tenth of plastic used in Canada ultimately being recycled, reduction is key. Should we just not be recycling? Well, recycling should be uh, really down as a last resort. And yet Canada continues its consumption and in many cases exporting our problem for others to deal with. David Common, CBC News, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Welcome back to Hearing Now. For a retired car salesman, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. You may remember Harry Phillips' story from back in August. In 1964, he sold the first Ford Mustang ever made. According to his granddaughter, Harry has been wanting to visit the car for quite some time. And as the CBC's Sanjay Maru reports from Detroit, that dream finally came true. <laughs> Joy and elation on the face of 84-year-old Harry Phillips, paying a visit to the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit. But he's not your average member of the Mustang Club. That's because the native of St. John's, Newfoundland, sold the first Ford Mustang ever manufactured back in 1964. We didn't know that it was the first Mustang. The serial number 001 really didn't mean too much to us at the time. The car was a pre-production model, not meant to be sold to customers. 
but without realizing that, he sold it for $4,300, peanuts by today's standards. Ford eventually got the car back, and it sat in the Detroit Museum since 1984. I just thought, I wonder could this actually happen? Um, how cool would it be before his 85th birthday to get him to actually see this car again? Philip's granddaughter turned to social media to coordinate the effort called Send Harry to Henry. In August, the museum sent out a and formal remember, invitation. It's been more than 50 years since Harry Phillips has last seen this car, and when you ask him what looks different about it as he looks at it today in this museum, he'll tell you not a thing. Brought back a lot of memories. It was really good. Just the time. Like, this is 55 years ago, you know, I mean, that's a lot of time. And with a bit of celebrity fame to go with it, Phillips can now look ahead to his 85th birthday, having achieved his dream more than five decades in the making. Sanjay Maru, CBC News, Detroit. In international news, Prince Harry followed... <clears throat> excuse me, in his late mother's footsteps today in a visit to a demining field in Angola. This mine field here in uh, Luingi Luana National Park is the first of 153 that will be cleared in the two national parks of southeastern Angola. Like his mother Diana in 1997, Harry strapped on protective gear for part of today's tour. And like his mother, Harry pushed the button to get rid of another explosive device, one of the countless that riddled Angola's landscape during the Civil War in the 1970s. Many minefields have now been cleaned up. The danger zone that Diana once walked through is today a thriving town. Prince Harry visited the region as part of an African tour with his wife, Meghan, and baby son. On Archie. Well, a Quebec resident has been diagnosed with the first confirmed case of severe vaping related illness in Canada. But federal health officials say there are reports of other incidents being investigated. In the U.S., there have been 13 deaths and hundreds of reported cases, many but not all related to vaping products containing THC. It's adding to the growing concern about the potential risks involving e cigarettes. Christine Birak has more details about the case in Quebec. We know the patient is in their 50s, was having trouble breathing, and ended up in the intensive care unit. We also know this person started vaping in April to try to help them quit smoking. What we don't know is what product was used. No doubt this case has some people shaking their heads. E-cigarettes are being sold as a less harmful alternative for smokers. Now, no one's saying those who started vaping to quit smoking should go back to cigarettes. But Quebec health officials say a ban on e-cigarettes could happen. If the evidence that we have in the next days or months makes us think that the threat is very important, we could ban it. And, and you know, uh, there is different powers and, and we are looking at, at this actually. Another severe case of a vaping related illness was reported in London, Ontario last week. A high school student was put on a respirator after using e-cigarettes. That case hasn't been fully confirmed yet, but the teen has since recovered. Doctors are expecting more new cases in this country. In the U.S., there have now been more than 800 people hospitalized and 13 deaths tied to vaping related lung illnesses. In terms of symptoms, doctors are looking for cough, shortness of breath or chest pain, nausea, vomiting or diarrhea, fatigue, fever or abdominal pain. And anyone using e-cigarettes or vaping products and experiencing those symptoms should go see a doctor. No one cause has been established for all the lung illnesses. Health experts are now calling on the government to better regulate the vaping industry, get rid of all the ads and the flavors that are appealing to children. Health Canada will only say that it's preparing recommendations. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto.
you just get that call. That call, it changes your life forever. That's when they told me that she had meningitis. This is my story, a special series on Here and Now. Well, I heard I was a diabetic with no pills, and the third day I said, well, what am I gonna do? She accepted the DNA and she started to generate her own blood cells, and it was amazing. We're checking back in with people who have faced some major life challenges to see where they are today. I'm looking towards going back to school and finish my book I'm writing. He definitely don't pick berries. No, I, I don't anymore. go picking berries anymore. No. More segments airing this fall on Here and Now. And this is my story. Time now for a look at the long range forecast. So mm -hmm. how is uh, tomorrow looking to start? Yeah, so tomorrow the sun will, will come out <laughs> for most of us. We'll take a look at the forecast, especially the south coast. It's the best chance uh, that we will likely see that sunshine and then towards central as well. Now along the northeast coast, I'm keeping that drizzle in there in cloud cover for at least the first half of the day. And then we should see uh, some peaks of sun into the afternoon. But those temperatures will be the warmest in central Grand Falls, Windsor should reach a high near 17 degrees and then up through Labrador uh, again tonight. If you look up in Lab West, there's a good chance we could see the Aurora, but uh, into tomorrow morning, those clouds will move back in and that chance of showers. Those winds will shift from south to northwesterly and that is going to play a role in the type of precipitation that we see on Sunday. Now I mentioned it a little bit earlier. We are looking at that risk of some snow into Sunday and you can see if I just walk out of frame here, uh, that blue stuff starts to show up. So we are looking at that risk, especially into Sunday for Lab West. Showers will move in early on uh, Sunday morning for the uh, western portion of the island and then spread further east through the day. And then we get into that northwesterly flow again. So some cooler temperatures expected with that. That moves off and we're starting to see some uh, activity as well. Potential for some snow in the mountains and then uh, same for the long range mountains as well as we head into Monday. So that snow isn't as far as we are far away as we think it is. Uh, yeah, so as far as those temperatures go on Sunday, this is what we're going to see. So those gray skies will stick around anywhere from 12 to 14 degrees through the day. Uh, Labrador, Happy Valley, Goose Bay looking at 11 degrees 7 for Nain with sunshine. And then there's those temperatures, 3 degrees for Lab City. And again, that chance of some snow through the day. Wet snow more than likely. And as we head through the overnight, uh, we'll likely see some more snow there as well. Now, uh, for the next five days, we're going to hang on to these double digits through the weekend with, uh, again, that potential for some showers. Monday, we start to dip down into those single digits. And with that, uh, it looks like we're going to stay there now for at least the next week or so. Tuesday and Wednesday, sun could peak out, but generally looking at uh, a wet day. Now for central Newfoundland, uh, 12 degrees on Sunday and then dipping into those single digits again, mainly cloudy for Tuesday. For western Newfoundland, 6 degrees by Monday, 7 on Tuesday with some sunshine and then up through Labrador, uh, double digits for the weekend and then again single digits those overnight lows dipping and then Wednesday for uh, is when we'll probably see that first chance of some some flakes there now for Western Labrador 10 degrees tomorrow and then those single digits those overnight lows overnight into the minus single digits and then sunshine for Tuesday. Well this uh, looks very summer like this photo we want to know where you're to I'll tell you where this was taken for the break.
Time to find out who's celebrating. Happy 50th anniversary today to Doreen and Ken Cave of Conception Bay South. Bud and Linda Reeder of McIvers are also celebrating a golden anniversary today. Happy 61st anniversary to Carl and Joyce Smith of Hence Harbor. Congratulations to Roy and Marie Anthony of Pillies Island who are celebrating their 64th anniversary. Happy 57th wedding anniversary this Sunday to Jake and Violet King from Broad Cove. Happy 90th birthday to Ralph Coombs from Head of Bay Despair. He celebrated on Tuesday. Happy 90th birthday today to Viola Reed from Reedville, now living in Deer Lake. Happy birthday to Muriel Moulton of Winterland, who turned 92 this past Tuesday. And happy 90th birthday to Lillian Bannister from Random Island, now living in Cornerbrook. Happy 92nd birthday to Winnie Rose of Orker Pit Cove, who celebrated her birthday yesterday. Happy 52nd wedding anniversary to Bill and Rona Stuckless of Twillingate. Happy anniversary to Albert and Alice Langmead of Pooch Cove. They also celebrated 52 years together this week. Wishing John and Darlene Kellaway of Salmon Cove a very happy 58th anniversary. Congratulations to Cyril and Millicent Shepherd in Lewisport. Tomorrow is their 73rd anniversary. 50th anniversary greetings going out to Myrtle and Harold Pelly of Glenwood. Congratulations to Pearl and George Lane from Botwood. Their 62nd anniversary was on Wednesday. Doug and Ella Mercer are celebrating their 50th anniversary today. Congratulations. Happy 53rd wedding anniversary to Frank and Lydia, or Linda rather, Ward of Gambo. Birthday wishes to Nellie Power of Marysville, celebrating her 91st birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday to Maude Reed from Lady Cove, now living in Clarenville. Her 90th birthday is on Sunday. Happy birthday to Annie Green in Winterton, who celebrated her 92nd birthday on Wednesday. And happy 98th birthday to this fine gentleman who lives in Gander. Now, we didn't get his name, but uh, we hope you have a wonderful birthday. Congratulations going out to Joyce Cooper of Brunette Island, now living in Grand Bank. She turns 90 tomorrow. Happy 92nd birthday to Marianne Skinner of Lourdes. Congratulations to Albert and Helen Pike from St. Lawrence who are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Happy 57th anniversary to Lewis and Loretta Saunders of Woodstock. They celebrated yesterday. Happy 63rd anniversary to Minnie and Robert Gulledge of Kellegrews. And happy 50th anniversary greetings to Max and Diane Perry of Lumsden. Congratulations to David and Effie Hollett of Goose Bay. They're celebrating 58 years of marriage. Happy 90th birthday to Greta Roberts, originally from Cape Onion on the tip of the Great Northern Peninsula, now living in Mount Pearl. Happy 65th anniversary to Bert and Ruby Elliott of Summerford, now living in Lewisburg. Happy 62nd anniversary tomorrow to Melvin and Shirley Gillingham of Cornerbrook. Happy 50th anniversary to Paul and Bride Murphy of Melrose. Wishing Ed and Shirley Eastman of Grand Falls, Windsor a very happy 61st anniversary today. Happy 55th anniversary to Dawson and Sue Oak of Gander. They celebrated on Tuesday. Happy 50th anniversary to Jesse and Danny Broders of Beta Verde. And happy 90th birthday to Dorothy Sutcliffe of Paradise. Birthday greetings to Marjorie Baker of Grand Bank, who turns 93 on Sunday. Happy 93rd birthday to Jesse Payne. Hope you have a great birthday. And here's a big one. Happy 103rd birthday on October 1st to Nellie Seward of Lewisport. Happy 91st birthday to Gertie Late of Davidsville. Bessie Taylor of Rally is celebrating her 93rd birthday today. Birthday greetings going out to Alan Freeman of Gander, who celebrated his 98th last Sunday. Dave and May Butt from Carboneer will be celebrating their 56th anniversary tomorrow. Happy 62nd anniversary greetings tomorrow to Henry and Edna Crocker of Greens Harbor. Happy 50th uh, anniversary today to Arthur and Barbara Pike of Baytona, now living in Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 50th anniversary coming up on October 3rd to Don and Winnie Piercy of Walbush. And happy anniversary to Alice and Stanley Chazon of Cape St. George, who are celebrating 67 years of love. Congratulations. 
Well, a former Humboldt Broncos player who survived that deadly bus crash last year is now being featured in a video for Adidas. As a kid, I dreamed of playing for Team Canada. And I still do. That's Ryan Strasnitsky gritting it out in the weight room. The 20-year-old hockey player was paralyzed from the chest down after the Broncos bus collided with a transport truck on Saskatchewan uh, Highway in Saskatchewan. He signed a multi-year deal with Adidas to take part in various hockey and training ads. Ryan's new goal, making Canada's national sledge hockey team. That's nice. What a great story. Yeah. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. And this is a beautiful photo that you have yes, for us. Yes, just before the break showed you a gorgeous photo. I'm going to assume that this photo was taken uh, probably a couple of weeks ago. A beautiful scene there, and this was taken in Elliston. Yeah, it does look like it's much warmer <laughs> much weather. Warmer. Things have taken a really great turn, it, I feel, it, in the past couple of weeks. It certainly has. Uh, yeah, it definitely looks warmer in that photo than we've been seeing for the past couple of days. But yeah, perfect day in Elliston. Uh, Marina Hoskins sent us that photo. Thank you so much for sending it in. And if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us from your weekend adventure, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Weekend adventures. Yes, it is the weekend. The weekend is here. <laughs> it's time for those adventures. Yeah. I hope you have a wonderful weekend with uh, lots of adventures and some decent weather as, as we head out uh, on the weekend. Yeah, so hopefully tomorrow we'll see bad. the sun. Yeah. All right. Well, enjoy. Have a great weekend, everyone. Good, Good night. night.